I lie. I lie on accident sometimes. I lie on purpose sometimes. To spare your feelings, to spare mine. I lie because I have always lied. I lie, which is to say, I am a liar. This is true. The summer before I met Mike Daisy, <laughs> I turned 28. This is true. <laughs> the summer before I met Mike Daisy, my roommate Jake died in our apartment, the hottest week of a Brooklyn July. Our other roommate Willow, Jake's best friend, found his body on my birthday. I had been in Manhattan for the week and she had been in Eugene, Oregon. I don't know what she found, uh, what state his body was in. She gave me the gift of never describing it. What I know is that by the next day, everything our, in our apartment had been taken away and incinerated, except a broken television and a glass bong sitting on the windowsill. Or, this is what the man I was in love with told me. He went to look. I have never gone back to that apartment. This is true. My birthday is July 25th. This is true. So is Mike Daisy's. <laughs> this is a lie. <laughs> I met Mike Daisy in October. It was probably October. She could find out, but she doesn't want to take the time because she's a little bit lazy. <laughs> Sometime in 2007, the year I met Mike Daisy, my best friend started sleeping with the man I was in love with, lied to me about it for six months, and eventually destroyed a carefully constructed creative community and my life in New York. This is an incredibly reductive and biased condensation of a deeply complicated set of events <laughs> involving a lot of people, a lot of text messages, a lot of emails, a lot of screaming, a lot of miscommunication, and a lot of alcohol. The year I met Mike Daisy, I quit drinking. Only for two months. <laughs> The year I met Mike Daisy, I laid in bed for days on end, crying, smoking pot, watching TV on the internet, and hating myself. This is what she remembers the fall and winter feeling like, but it's not true. Mm -hmm. The year I met Mike Daisy, I got fired from my job. This is sort of true. The year I met Mike Daisy, I decided to really be a playwright. She had been writing plays for ten years at that point, and still doesn't know if she really wants to be a playwright. I met Mike Daisy because we were both in the Soho Rep Writer Director Lab. This writing group was and is a prestigious opportunity for experimental playwrights, and at the time, the biggest thing that had happened in my playwriting career. This is true. Everyone in the group was older, smarter, and more accomplished than I was, and Mike Daisy was famous. Or it felt that way to her. <laughs> Which is all to say that the year I met Mike Daisy, suddenly my personal life was falling apart at the same time that my writing life was coming together. This is true. We were all confused about why Mike Daisy was in a playwriting group as he announces whenever he can that he is not a playwright. He is a storyteller. He does not write. He talks. But he decided he wanted to write a play and so there he was writing his first play. This is true. I saw Mike Daisy every other Sunday from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. from October 2007 With to April 2008. slight variations and etc. which are not important to the story. The play I was writing was about Seattle where Mike Daisy once lived, where we are right now. I was born and raised here, and whenever I am gone, I miss it terribly. And whenever I'm here, all I can think about is leaving. This is true. <laughs> <laughs> Mike Daisy was writing a play that was about a Cold War era cosmonaut who sci fiically is transmitted through the radio tubes at the moment of his death and materializes in a listening station in Antarctica where two Americans were listening to him die. When he materializes, he has superpowers, which he uses to recreate the woman he is in love with, who does not love him, out of ice and snow. And when she is magically animated and still does not love him, he rapes her over and over. <laughs> this is what she remembers from the play, but it was a long time ago. It's called The Moon is a Dead World and it was produced at Annex Theatre in October 2008. One of the drafts of the play I was writing uh, that I brought in was called The Past is Not a Foreign Country, Maps of Seattle. It was 73 pages long. This is true. It consisted of a two-page scene between a character named Information Booth Girl and a character named Tourist. She worked at the Information Booth at the Pike Place Market for a year before she moved to New York. 
uh, followed by a play within the play called History Takes Time, History Makes Memory, a children's play, with apologies to Gertrude Stein, mm -hmm. which consisted of literally 15 pages of carefully arranged Gertrude Stein quotes, which told the history of Seattle through a pattern of dates and population numbers, and was intended to be developed into a kind of crazy children's play with dances and projections. <laughs> Let me repeat that. 15 pages of Gertrude Stein quotes. 15 pages of Gertrude Stein quotes. 15 pages of Gertrude Stein quotes. This is true. This section ends with 1972, Information Booth Girl. No one is ahead of his time. It is only that the particular variety of creating his time is the one that his contemporaries, who are also creating their own time, refuse to accept. For a very long time, everybody refuses, and then almost, without a pause, almost everybody accepts. In the history of the refused in the arts and literature, the rapidity of the change is always startling. She thinks this could possibly be a good idea, but she isn't really sure. She never tried it. It was cut from the next draft. The next section consists of 39 monologues of varying lengths, which were written by 39 different people who live or lived here in response to the prompt, do a three minute free write on what Seattle is for you. After these 39 monologues, there are two scenes, scenes each is less than a page. One is between Tim and Information Booth Girl. <laughs> I've never lived here, but I've spent so much of my time here, and when I do, I'm on Capitol Hill, going from bar to bar, and I always seem to end up at a Pacific Island-themed pub. I've never known the name of this bar, but I always seem to end my nights on Capitol Hill there. The ceiling is fake grass to make it look like a hut. It's called the Cha-Cha, and it's not there anymore. I hate that place. <laughs> <laughs> the thing Tim said was also in response to the writing prompt written by someone named Tim, and it was the year they tore the Cha-Cha down. For clarification, my name is also Tim, but I didn't write that. She didn't know me then. It was a different Tim. <laughs> <laughs> then, a scene between Information Booth Girl and Fake Seattleite that is even shorter, but that I did, in fact, write. She grew up in Wallingford and really hates it when people from Issaquah or wherever say they're from Seattle. <laughs> <laughs> Followed by eight haiku about Seattle musicians slash bands. She has absolutely no musical talent and is still upset about this. <laughs> a second play within the play called Hipster Boy and Information Booth Girl, A Love Story, <laughs> which is five pages long. This section ends with Hipster Boy saying, it's a good thing you don't live here anymore. Now she lives here again. <laughs> The next section begins like this. The stranger's staff emerges from the crowd one by one. They have been drinking beer since they arrived. Eric Grandy. November 28, 2007. Beerly beloved, we are gathered here today to mourn the death of the 500 block of East Pine Street. What follows is three pages of excerpts from that issue of The Stranger, Eric Grandy, Bradley Steinbacher, Paul Constant, Lindy West, Kelly O, Mark Mitchell, Kathleen Wilson. The stage direction was longer, but it was kind of mean, and she didn't want to read it in front of the entire staff of The Stranger. <laughs> and then a Sestina I wrote, which ends like this. Ballard will always be Denny's, Capitol Hill is my 20s, and Fremont is an empty space. The U District could get sucked into a hole. Downtown is functional, and Wallingford is home. She was obsessed with formal poetry that year for better or for worse. And of course, the whole 73 page draft ends with another page of Gertrude Stein quotes, and the entire cast, which if you are keeping count is up to 51 at this point, saying the soothing thing about history is that it does repeat itself. She was also obsessed with Gertrude Stein that year, she still is. Mike Daisy did not think this was a play. I don't remember anymore what he said to me that day, but I do remember that I went home and cried. It is equally as possible that she went home out to a bar with some guy <laughs> she really shouldn't have slept with, got wasted and went home with him. She doesn't actually remember. It is definitely true that at some point Mike da Daisy told her this wasn't a play and she cried. Granted, I cried constantly that year, but that day Mike Daisy made me cry. And yes, my draft was a mess, but looking back at it for the first time in four years, it could have been a more interesting piece than what I ended up coming to, which was a play much more about Jake's death and my sadness than the city of Seattle. 
Though I cry all the time, I hate crying. And if you make me cry, I may never forgive you. This is true. My friend Madeline brought her beautiful play, Precious Little, into the lab the next session, and all Mike Daisy had to say about it was, he liked the font. This is true. <laughs> <laughs> One session, I walked in with a new haircut, and by haircut, I mean probably it was the first time I had shown up showered in clean clothes, looking even remotely like a person, the whole life falling apart thing. And when I walked in not looking terrible for the first time, Mike Daisy applauded and got the rest of the room to applaud. This did not make me feel awesome. She cut her hair yesterday in the bathroom, probably from remembering this, who knows. And I won't make you applaud because that would be mean. <laughs> I hated Mike Daisy. But then I saw his monologues and I couldn't hate him anymore because they were amazing. This is true. A couple months ago, the week after the This American Life episode came out, the original one, Nancy Usher, the president of Cornish, where I teach now sometimes, where I went to college, where my father has taught for more than 20 years, asked me what I thought of Mike Daisy getting an honorary degree. And I said, I thought it would be an amazing idea. She asked me if I thought he should give the keynote speech, and I said, yes, I thought that was an amazing idea. I said, Mike Daisy is an incredible storyteller. Mike Daisy is the most important solo performer in the world right now. Mike Daisy is showing that you can change the world through art. Doing that thing we all say we want to do. The thing that when I am my best self, I want to do, I try to do. The thing that I hope to inspire my students to do. So yes, Nancy, yes. Mike Daisy should give the graduation speech at Cornish this year. That would be amazing. This is true. And then last week I found out that Mike Daisy is a liar. This is true. I've been reading and listening to everything. What he has said, what everyone else has said, what my friends have said. Nowhere have I heard him use the word lie. He hasn't said, I am a liar. This is true. The most recent thing he said, he wrote, included the words, quote, Things came out of my mouth that just weren't true. <laughs> and over time, I couldn't even hear the difference myself, end quote. Which is not the same thing as saying I lied, I am a liar. I stayed up all night, the night they broadcast the retraction episode, refreshing Twitter, refreshing Facebook, the same way I did during the first days of the Egyptian revolution, and the moments when Occupy Wall Street felt to me like it might change the world. I read the internet looking for Mike Daisy, looking for the truth. I hated Mike Daisy for petty personal reasons that I let go. I hated him because he made me feel small when I felt very, very small already. I hated him because he made me cry. And then he changed the world and I couldn't hate him anymore. I am not my best self today. Today, I hate Mike Daisy. I hate him because looking back at that draft of that crazy play, I am so much more excited about it than anything I have written since. And I have been to grad school since then, and I've written so many plays since then, and done so many things, and met so many people. And I had Mike Daisy's voice in my head that whole time, telling me when I was writing what I wanted to write, it wasn't a play. And I kept trying to make it go away, and he kept getting more famous. And my plays keep getting more normal, and I keep hating theater more and more, and hating writing more and more, and sitting down less and less. Like I said, I am a liar, but I lie about unimportant things. This is true. <laughs> I hate Mike Daisy again, or maybe I don't. I think he broke my heart. This is true. As far as I know, Cornish is still giving Mike Daisy an honorary degree, and he is still giving the graduation speech. Cornish gives honorary PhDs, but only confers BFAs, so the honor itself is a lie. <laughs> if he does give the speech, I'll go, and it will be the first Cornish graduation that I've intended since my own. This is true.